taste is more important than anything else, as far as food is concerned anyway. Chinese have never restricted themselves to a certain tedious food list. With their understanding of food, Chinese are always looking for an inspiration and change. Once the clouds clear up, Yao Gui Wun moves the split bamboo baskets to the terrace. He and his wife have spent days making the tofu balls. Some tofu has already turned yellowish, but that's far from enough. Yao has to wait several more days. When it gets hard and shriveled, and the skin turns black, the tofu has matured. The change is because of fermentation. <laughs> Wang Cui Hua tightly wraps the shapeless tender tofu with gauze and squeezes out the water. Then the tofu finally takes shape. There is no time to lose. The fresh tofu will quickly turn sour. It means that Wang has to work very quickly without any rest. A basin of charcoal fire of proper heat will be the key to Yao's work in the afternoon. Jian Shui in Honghe Prefecture of Yunnan Province was named Lin An in ancient times. It was once an important city in southwest China during the past 1,200 years. Its brilliance has gradually faded with the passage of time. Just like many other towns in Yunnan, Jian Shui is a multi-ethnic settlement. Different cultures have merged here, conjuring a unique atmosphere. The tough tofu quickly inflates in the heat of charcoal fire. It reminds people of fermented flour. People of Jian Shui like enjoying this special air-dried and fermented flavor. <laughs> People can enjoy the tofu with varied sauces. But for Yao, the texture of tofu is the most important. <laughs> tofu easily ferments in the warm weather of the River Valley area and the mildly dry air prevents it from rotting. Yao is more sensitive than anyone else to the subtle relations between wind, water, sunshine and, of course, tofu. This is the famous Daban Well of Jian Shui. Beside the well, women set up a production line of tofu by just using their fingers. Water is a necessity in every procedure of making tofu. With a total of 128 wells in Jian Shui, 
Local residents are well versed with water. The Chinese believe that water nourishes the spirit and mind of the people. Just like water to tofu, the common points speak for themselves. The ancient town of Xiping is less than 40 kilometers from Jianshui. Tofu here has a completely different look. The finished product is shockingly big, but it's unusually tenacious and it almost doesn't crumble. of salt can best preserve the tofu's freshness. Yunnan has never been a major soybean production area, but it does have a long history of making tofu. one corn for one piece of tofu. There is a tacit agreement between the buyer and the seller. Four yuan for another two pieces. For the past three decades, Yao's tofu stall has never been quiet. It takes half an hour to walk from the stall to home and Yao has to go across almost the entire town. The rapid development has changed many aspects of Jianshui. As time goes by, some variables have disappeared and others altered. New ones are also added. But there are some that stand the test of time and still remain. The Yao's life centered on tofu is watery and hard. The biggest wish of the husband is to fish in the big lake far away. He has no merits but only shortcomings. Very lazy and clumsy. <laughs> you were perfect. <laughs> to the couple, every piece of tofu is precious. It helps them to support their children and sustain a happy family life. Over the last 1,000 years, with rounds of northern immigration, tofu the representative of central China's food culture, has taken roots in the abundant land on the southwest border. It's developed a unique disposition. The production details remind us of the hinterland of central China that is thousands of miles away. There, from birth to prosperity, Tofu has enjoyed a history of 2,000 years. Hu <laughs> Shua Bing is on his way to the county town. He needs to sell his tofu at the morning market. Shoshian County is an old little town in northern Anhui province. People there have a special attachment to tofu. They believe their ancestors invented the great tofu.
In mid-October, soybeans in northern Anhui have already been reaped and stored. Tofu made with newly harvested soybeans has always been the most popular. In China's thousand-year-old history of agriculture, soybean has long occupied an important position. Among the well-known legumes, soybean is the richest in protein. It's also the cheapest sustenance. But it was once in an awkward position. Cooked soybeans failed to wet people's appetite and to make matters worse, caused flatulence. People urgently needed to find the best way to consume soybeans. The white powder on the scale is gypsum, the key to turning soy milk into tofu. Hu Xuabing can use gypsum as skillfully as his ancestors. One more time? No, it would be overdone. When the denatured protein meets with gypsum, the boiling soy milk quickly coagulates. The change is so drastic that it can be seen in the blink of an eye. In ancient days, gypsum often appeared in secret scriptures of Chinese warlocks. It's said that that was how the relation between gypsum and tofu originally started. Over 2,000 years ago, Liu An, the king of Huainan, was addicted to alchemy. When nurturing immortal pills in soy milk, he happened to add some gypsum in it. Many people believe that's how tofu was invented. Regardless of whether the reality was as dramatic as the story, the Chinese must have been groping for a long time before finally making tofu a great food of China. The invention of tofu, however, completely changed the fate of soybeans. With great flexibility, tofu offered a huge space for the imagination of the Chinese, well known for its culinary skills. The disadvantages of soybeans were eliminated by reason or unconsciously. As the ancient Chinese transformed soybeans into tofu, The value of soybean protein to human body reached a climax with the invention of tofu. Chinese cooks' understanding of tofu will often take you by surprise. Maybe it's also correct to say that the Chinese are showing their adaptability through tofu. Thus, soybean has been sublimated. The milky juice arouses many thoughts in our mind. On the vast grassland of North China, the Mongolian nomads are nourished by another flowing delicacy.
In late September, the green cover is fading on Ujimchin grassland. Mengke and his family are seizing the last days for grazing before the bitter winter arrives. A chill is felt in the late autumn on the grassland. Dried cow manure can make the fire burn up. Milk tea is always a must for breakfast. Brick tea, butter, stir-fried millet and fresh milk are the important ingredients for making milk tea. Milk curd was made several days ago. Milk tea and curd are indispensable for people living on the grassland. They provide vitamins and minerals that can't be gained from vegetables and fruits. <laughs> Grassland has the magical power to make things simple. Mudu, the cattle of Mung Ke, is in the lactation period. <laughs> to get fresh milk from the cow, Mung Ke's mother has to get permission from the calf. Fresh milk no longer ferments as easily as during warmer days. The mother must hurry to make the milk curd as food reserve for the long winter. The sour cream on the surface is carefully ladled out and the cream is very precious. Fermented milk curdles. Protein and whey are separated when heated. The whey, though, won't be wasted, as it's best for feeding livestock. You have to keep stirring the juice so that the curdled milk won't stick to the pot. When the whey is fully separated, the hot, curdled milk is poured into molds. <laughs> Mung Ke offers the fresh milk curd to his grandfather. It's the best delicacy. Heading straight south, an almost identical scene is happening in Yunnan, thousands of miles away. Thick and heavy chopsticks are moved vigorously. A smooth, curdled milk lump has soon been rolled. After several moves, the dough is dragged into a sheet, which is then rolled up onto the bamboo rack by the wall. In faraway Dali, Yunnan, a similar method is adopted by the Bai minority to transform milk. Rushan, made from milk, are hung and air dried in the yard, just like giant wind chimes. Over 800 years ago, during the reign of Kublai Khan, the expeditionary Mongolians arrived and settled in Yunnan. They brought dairy products from their home. Unexpectedly, the way to transform milk has been passed down and still prospers even today.
Mother takes the hardened milk curd out of the wooden box. Dried milk curd can be preserved for an extremely long time. Meat is a luxury as livestock are so precious. Dairy products have almost become the main food on the grassland. This is a Mongolian restaurant in downtown Beijing. The mouth-watering roast lamb back is the top choice for diners here. It easily reminds us of the crude lifestyle on the grassland. But to people living in the depths of the grassland, milk products are more close to their real life. Rain brings temperatures down to freezing. Mung Ker's second elder sister has found a lost lamb in the bush. Livestock are family assets and a part of a nomad's life. Munker has changed into his new winter robe. Hot tea and milk curd keep him warm. And the milk products will continuously provide calories to sustain the entire morning's herding. The telescope is the legacy of his grandfather's. Munker lost his father at the age of three. He learned to herd from his grandfather. The grandfather has told him that it's good enough for him to be a qualified herdsman. Horse pole in hand, Munker throws himself on his horse, feeling full of strength. Out of the grassland, herding is substituted by farming. Without the conditions for grazing cattle and sheep, people choose to cultivate the limited land. Dairy products have failed to hold their space in kitchens of central China. People living in farming culture have shifted their eyes to plant resources to obtain precious protein. It was revolutionary for the Chinese to gain protein from plants. To the Chinese, who historically had insufficient meat supply, the discovery was wisdom as well as luck. In an ancient temple on Mount Tiantai, the monks are preparing the most important meal of the day. Monks have vegetarian diets. The monastic life is poor and simple. Even dining is a practice of Buddhism. In fact, only Han Buddhism in China includes vegetarian diet in its religious disciplines. That has deeply impacted traditional vegetarianism in China over the past 1,000 years. Originating from plants, tofu conforms to the strictest discipline and it provides the best possible nutrition for the body. 
Soybean is the only plant food that matches meat for protein quality. So to vegetarians, it's perfect. Despite its plainness, Chinese tofu is given a certain spiritual quality. The ancient people praised it, saying, tofu has merits. Those who have tofu are content with a simple life. And those who make tofu understand it's best to let life take its course. The unique geological environment and mild weather in southern Anhui have brought about the calm and conservative qualities in its people. It's also produced unique food. The strange food covered with white haifa is actually tofu. As the season for mass production has not yet arrived, the hairy tofu in Feng Xingyu's shop is a rare commodity worth hoarding. It will be sold out before noon. The heavy hair covering tofu launches our imagination. We liken it, for example, to an animal. And there is indeed life in it. The white, thin hair is the haifa of mukor, which gives tofu a new vitality. It's hard to believe how this food is actually made. Today, Fang Xingyu has handed over most of the work in the workshop to her elder daughter. Fang has begun to associate the future of the shop with her. The surface of soybean milk gradually coagulates which shows that soybean is rich in oil. But to produce hairy tofu, oil isn't required. Tofu skin is hung on the chopstick. When air dried, it becomes a byproduct of hairy tofu, another delicacy with a totally different texture. The key to producing hairy tofu is to add self-made sour juice into soy milk for fermentation. The sour substance can make soy protein clot. What's more important is that microorganisms flow into the milk with the pouring of the sour juice. It's just like burying seeds into tofu. No matter where you are in China, making tofu is extremely hard work. Family members sit down at and leave the dining table in succession. The elder sister is always the last one to come. Her sister will accompany her to finish the already cold dishes. I don't want her to always work like this. I don't want her to be like mum. To the mother and the elder sister, the tofu workshop has already become a major part of their lives. Fang will not make hairy tofu in the sultry summer. We can't control the fermentation of tofu in sauna days. But in other seasons, the warm and humid environment in Huizhou makes microorganisms ferment properly.
Fung hopes her daughter can learn and understand everything about making tofu. The hair is actually fungi. The index showing where the yeast and germs are growing harmoniously. It decides the progress of fermentation and whether the final product is delicious or not. Huijo people, who are gourmets, can truly appreciate hairy tofu. You can have it in a simple or complicated way. In the mind of old Huijo people, a bit of chili sauce goes best with roast tofu. The interior of tofu is completely different. Mucor secretes proteinase, making soy protein degrade into smaller molecules of peptone, polypeptide and amino acids. This series of transformations gives tofu an incomparable flavor. Weijo people call this strong flavor a flavor of hometown. The small grains among the haifa are spores, an indication that the hairy tofu has properly matured. The clever Chinese are proficient in using microorganisms. In fact, the wisdom of transformation sparkled early in ancient times. Wine is probably the earliest case of how people transformed food with microorganisms. Huangju, literally meaning yellow wine brewed from rice, is one of the oldest wines in the world. It's the morning of Li Dong, the start of winter. It has started to drizzle in Shaoxing. It's a good sign for winemakers. Yeast favors the long but mild coldness of winter in Jiangnan, south of the lower Yangtze Valley. The winemakers go in and out of the wine workshop, getting ready for tributes at the sacrifice. This is the day to worship the god of wine. No one dares to slight it. Even the best winemaker can't ensure that he can brew the best wine every year due to the capricious weather, wind, air and fungi. Every year, the sacrifice is for the winemakers to show their reverence for nature. Winter brewing is about to begin in Shaoxing. Also located in the Gu Yue region, Xuning of Anhui is on the same latitude as Shaoxing. 73-year-old Chung Jin Shun is busy brewing homemade glutinous rice wine. Brewing wine isn't difficult for old people. In the abundant Jiangnan, rice is an indispensable part of life here.
it's only natural to make several jars of wine to treat themselves and treat their guests, as well as worship gods during the slack season of farming. The cocoon-shaped Jiu Chu, or fermentation starter, is the soul of winemaking. Jiu Chu is considered the seed with yeast. A variety of yeasts are lying in the mixture of rice powder and red knee herbs. They're waiting for the perfect time to wake up. Chung mixes the crushed Jiu Chu with glutinous rice. Jiu Chu is a great invention of the Chinese people. The most ancient and effective attempt of human beings at taming microorganisms. This is the most important step of making wine, which will bring about the most magical part of the transformation. A deep hole is dug in the well-mixed rice. Not a single grain of rice will be wasted. To distribute the last handful of Jiu-Chu powder, all the procedures are finished. Now, we'll just let time deal with the rest of the work. The molds will change the starch into sugar. The yeasts will turn the sugar into alcohol. We can almost hear the hilarious singing of yeasts spreading from the darkness. The longer the time, the more fragrant the wine will become. Guangzhou's flavor is thick and strong, and it stays for long. The Chinese can taste both the tenderness and the toughness in the wine. Guangzhou drinking Shaoxing people are mild and moderate and their persistence to the tradition has allowed them to enjoy the time-honored flavor. Almost every household in Shaoxing has soy sauce. Soy sauce is a must in the lives of the Shaoxing people, which has already become the most distinctive taste identity of Shaoxing. All food can be braised in soy sauce. Enough salt allows food to stay fresh in humidity. Food rolled in soy sauce gives off a special aroma. Local people call it the cuisine of home. Historically, Shaoxing had been a prosperous and abundant land. Even today, many people love to reside by the river, enjoying a relaxed life. The ancient town of Anchang, outside Shaoxing city, is built along the river. It's the season for making preserved meats. Bamboo poles of different length display their abundance. The sausage of Anchang is very famous in Zhejiang. Its good flavor is largely attributed to the locally brewed soy sauce. Dozens of giant jars stand in the yard of the sauce shop.
56-year-old Ding Guo Yun still works vigorously. The sauce is thick and sticky. Workers have to stir it with a fixed schedule to ensure that fermentation takes place evenly within the jar. And within the jar, the microorganisms restrict one another. One kind's loss is another's gain. The jars have been through many repairs during the past several decades. The direct exposure in the sun can greatly stimulate the vitality of yeasts. But rain could ruin everything. Time slips always in the repeated sound of the lids of the jars being moved away and put back. The source of China started a trend in human beings' history of fermentation. Several thousand years have passed and it has become a fundamental flavor on dining tables in China. In North China, the meaning of sauce is more straightforward. Only a little paste is left in the jar of Wang Yu Ying's. Enough salt ensures that the sauce won't get frozen in severe winter. In chilly northeast China, for quite a long time, salt in the form of sauce has provided physical and psychological support for people. Three months later, it'll be time to make new soybean paste. But the preparation work will start now. The cooked soybeans are smashed in the pot. In northeast China, soybean is the only ingredient for making sauce. The monopoly is also a luxury. Heilongjiang province boasts the most fertile black soil in China. The farming and harvest here is short and hasty, but the place produces the best soybeans. On the heated bed, six hands work together to pile the smashed beans into shape. The taste of paste can even be the standard to measure whether a housewife is qualified. The tightly wrapped raw paste is hung on the wall. Over the course of the next two months, it will quietly ferment. And when spring arrives, the transformation will get even more dramatic. Under the powerful Siberian high, the winter in North China is more unbearable than in other places. Facing the severe chill, people have learned to adapt themselves. After a more than 30-day complicated fermentation, the Chinese cabbage in the jar has gained a whole new life. The northern people have an unaffected love for pickled cabbage. 
In the winter, which lasts nearly seven months, the pickles have almost become a lifestyle. Squeezing out the sour water in the leaves not only gets rid of the bitterness, but also makes the cabbage taste more crispy. The pickled cabbage gives out a pleasant and savoury sour fragrance. That's the smell of lactic acid. After fermentation, oxalic acid is discomposed. When dissolved in water, protein gives out peptide and amino acid, which bring out this great flavour. The best partner of pickled cabbage is pork. Pickled cabbage subtly neutralises the natural grease of pork. The cauldron of the northern Chinese doesn't enjoy a delicate look, but the content inside the cauldron is just like the personality of the locals. Straightforward and generous. Today, the children will all come back to visit their parents. The pickled cabbage stuffed dumplings will be the main course for dinner. Time flies as usual and life remains prosperous. Another year has passed. We are amazed at the flavor and improvement of nutrition. And it's all thanks to the imaginative transformation of food. They have become a part of culture, passed down from generation to generation. <laughs>